In the heart of the ancient Teutoburg forest, history bore witness to a cataclysmic clash that would echo through the ages. It was here, on a fateful day in 9 AD, that the Roman legions led by Varus met their match in a cunning and relentless foe. Arrayed against them stood an alliance of Germanic tribes, united under the leadership of the indomitable Arminius. He, once a trusted officer within the Roman ranks, had mastered the art of deception, having imbibed the knowledge of Roman tactics and strategy. With meticulous planning and unwavering resolve, he lured Varus and his legions into a deadly trap, ensnaring them in the dense thickets of the forest. The Varian disaster, as it came to be known in the annals of Roman history, marked a turning point of unparalleled significance, shattering the illusion of invincibility that had long surrounded the Roman legions. Hello everyone. Welcome to ASMR Historian. I am your host. If you'd like to support the channel, why not consider looking at my Patreon, where all the videos are ad-free. Otherwise, you can support the channel by helping me in the algorithm, by subscribing, liking, and leaving your comments down below. Without further ado, let's begin our video for today, the battle and the legacy of Teutoburg Forest. Let's start from the beginning and set the scene so we can understand what led to this catastrophic event. In the wake of Julius Caesar's Gallic conquests, the Roman Republic stood as a formidable force in the first century BC, extending its dominion over vast territories in Western Europe. However, amidst the triumphs of Caesar's campaigns, the Germanic tribes across the Rhine posed a persistent challenge to Roman expansion. Despite Caesar's forays into Germania, notably crossing the Rhine on two occasions, the elusive nature of the German warriors and their guerrilla tactics stymied Roman efforts to assert dominance in the region. Following the turmoil of Caesar's assassination in 44, and the subsequent power struggles in Rome, attention shifted away from continental Europe, leaving the Gauls vulnerable to internal strife and external threats. It was not until the rise of Octavian, later known as Augustus, and the establishment of the Roman Empire in 27 BC, that Gaul once again became a focal point of Roman attention. Augustus's reorganization of Gaul into smaller provinces highlighted the strategic significance of the Rhine as a buffer against Germanic incursions. Although Rome's precise policy towards the Germanic tribes still remains ambiguous. The Roman defeat in the Lullian disaster of 16 BC served as a sobering reminder of the challenges posed by the Germanic tribes. In response, Augustus embarked on a concerted effort to subdue the restless frontier, appointing his stepson Drusus as the new governor of Gaul. 
Drusus then launched a series of successful campaigns against the Germanic tribes from 11 to 9 BC, earning a string of victories despite facing formidable obstacles. However, Drusus's sudden death in 9 BC all but halted Roman expansion into Germanic territory, leaving his brother, Tiberius, to inherit the mantle of command. Tiberius continued his brother's efforts to consolidate Roman control in Germany, confronting local uprisings and extending Roman influence up to the Elbe River. Despite these achievements, Tiberius's fall from favor and subsequent voluntary exile in 6 BC marked a turning point in Roman policy towards Germania. He was succeeded by Lucius Domitius Anubarus, who subdued further uprisings and became the first Roman general to cross the Elbe River. As the new century approached, Rome's relations with the Germanic tribes remained complex characterized by a delicate balance of diplomacy and, when needed, military force. In the early days of 6 AD, the Roman Empire mobilized a formidable force under the command of Saturninus and Consul Aemilius Lepidus. This massive army comprising of 13 legions with their accompanying personnel, totaling around 100,000 men, was deployed against Maribodus, the king of the Marcomanni, a prominent tribe of the Suebi. However, Tiberius, who had been overseeing operations in Germania, was compelled to divert his attention to quell the Bellum Batanianum, also known as the Great Illyrian Revolt that had erupted in the Balkans. Amidst these tumultuous events, Arminius, a trusted advisor to Varus, clandestinely orchestrated a coalition of Germanic tribes including traditional rivals like Cheruski, Marsi, Chatti, and Brukteri. Despite outward appearances of submission to Roman authority, these tribes seethed with resentment over perceived Roman oppression and brutality. With meticulous planning and patient coordination, Arminius cultivated this simmering discontent, waiting, waiting for the opportune moment to strike a decisive blow against Varus and his outnumbered legions. As Varus led his forces from their summer encampments towards winter headquarters near the Rhine, reports of a localized rebellion engineered by Arminius, reached his ears. Unaware of the broader conspiracy brewing against him, Varus heeded the call to suppress what he believed to be a minor uprising. Unwittingly walking into a meticulously laid trap set by his erstwhile ally. Publius Quintilius Varus, the central figure in the Varian disaster, rose through the ranks of the Roman Empire with notable swiftness and distinction. So let's understand a little bit about him first, before we go on. His ascent began when Emperor Augustus appointed him as quaestor in 22 BC 
a remarkable achievement, considering the usual age requirement of 30 for such a coveted position. Varus's subsequent military career saw him commanding the 19th Legion in 15th BC, and attaining the position of junior consul. His administrative talents were further recognized with appointments as governor of Africa in 8 BC, and later of Syria in 7 BC. A prestigious but challenging role amidst the complex political landscape of the Eastern Empire and its chaotic border regions. Well, despite the complexities of governing Syria, Varus demonstrated his capability by effectively addressing the succession crisis following the death of Herod the Great in 4 BC. However, contemporary accounts offer divergent assessments of his governance, with Josephus portraying Varus favorably while Patroclus implies corruption during his tenure. Varus's marriage to the emperor's great niece solidified his position within the imperial circle, leading to his eventual appointment to command in Germania in 7 AD. Varus's reputation extended far beyond the borders of the empire, characterized by both fear among the populace and respect from the Roman Senate. Commanding several legions along the Rhine, Varus wielded significant military authority. These legions, formerly under the leadership of Saturninus, were stationed at Castrum Mogantiacum, while Varus's nephew Asprenas likely led the other two legions in winter quarters. Varus's initial command in Germania comprised a formidable force, consisting of five legions alongside auxiliaries. During the early imperial period, each legion boasted approximately 4,800 men, supported by 120 light escort or scouting cavalry. With engineers, officers, and non-combatant servants included, a legion typically totaled around 5,000 fighting men. Varus's command of approximately 25,000 soldiers, excluding auxiliaries, constituted about 20% of the Roman frontline army. Now, however, despite the exact number of troops under Varus's command during the Battle of Teutoburg Forest remains uncertain, with estimates ranging from 20 to 30,000. At the time of the battle, only three legions, totaling approximately 50,000 men, remained under Varus's leadership, accompanied by nine small auxiliary units comprising of about 4,500. Winter attrition, including casualties and illness, likely diminished the legion's strength. It was a German winter, too wasn't an Italian winter. Two different things. While some historians like Cassius Dio suggest a significant civilian presence in the camp, others find this improbable due to recent military reforms that discouraged legionaries from bringing their families. It seems pretty obvious to me why you would not want to bring your family to the front line of the Germanic rebellions. But it was a different time back then. Well, despite variations in troop numbers, 
the main Roman army maintained a high level of professionalism and was outfitted with standardized weapons and armor by the state. This equipment typically included a gladius short sword, a large shield, a pilum javelin, a helmet, a mail shirt, and segmented armor. Conversely, auxiliary units relied on equipment and fighting styles reflective of their homelands, placing them on par with the Germanic troops that they encountered. Now, on to Arminius. We're going to learn a little bit about the other main character in this story. Arminius, hailing from the Cherusci tribe, emerged as the leader of the Germanic coalition. His unique background positioned him well to comprehend Roman tactics and strategy. Captured by the Romans at a young age, after Drusus's victory over his tribe in 8 BC, Arminius received an aristocratic education in Rome. Eventually, joining the Roman cavalry and commanding auxiliaries by 4 AD. Pretty impressive, don't you think? Despite his Roman affiliations, Arminius maintained ties to his beloved homeland in Germania. Well, you can take the boy out of Germania, but not the Germania out of the boy. Two pivotal events shaped Arminius's perception of Roman capabilities. A Cherusci ambush against Drusus in 11 BC and Drusus's subsequent victory over the Cherusci in 8 BC. From these encounters, Arminius gleaned a crucial lesson. While the Romans could be defeated, their tactical adaptability and discipline posed formidable challenges. It was not going to be easy. The size of Arminius's forces remains a major matter of conjecture due to the absence of written records. Estimates vary widely, with historians proposing figures ranging from 17,000 all the way up to 100,000 troops. Despite their varied origins, these Germanic warriors possessed combat experience, albeit lacking the standardized equipment of the Roman legions. While some fighters wielded heavy spears and javelins, many relied on basic shields and hunting weapons, with armor a rare commodity, acquired primarily from defeated Romans, or through service as Roman auxiliaries. Well, with all this, the stage was set for a straightforward campaign as winter loosened its grip in 9 AD. Barrus was unaware of the impending betrayal, and he meticulously planned the expedition the rendezvous point was Vetera, situated in present-day Xanten, Germany. From there, the Roman forces would traverse the Rhine, replenishing garrisons along the route as they advanced into Cherusky territory. Their objective, to establish a summer encampment within what was believed to be pacified Cherusky lands laying the groundwork for further operations in the region. Little did Varus know that he had already fallen into a trap. Arminius, his trusted confidant, 
had orchestrated this cunning deception. Under the guise of cooperation, Arminius manipulated Varus into positioning the Roman army within the heart of Cheruski territory, offering a strategic advantage to the German tribes. Pretty clever, huh? Arminius needs to get more credit, I think. As the Romans embarked on their return journey to winter quarters, they would be vulnerable to ambush in terrain that favoured Arminius. The timing of Arminius's betrayal remains a little mysterious. Whether seeded during his years as a Roman hostage, or solidified during his service alongside Varus in Germania. No one really knows. Nonetheless, by early 9 AD, Arminius had initiated a web of deceit, rallying Germanic chieftains to his clandestine cause. You know, he's winning me over. I like this Arminius. Can you imagine? You are taken away from everything you've known and loved, brought into what everybody tells you is civilization, told to forget who you are, become the enemy, fight with the Romans against your own people, and they think that you're just going to accept this? You've got to be joking. Certainly Arminius knows how to bide his time and get payback. There's a saying in Mandarin that I like. For a gentleman to take revenge, ten years is not too long to wait. Hell yeah. Anyway... Let's get back to it. Anticipating the inevitable Roman reprisal, Arminius sought to unite disparate tribes, bracing for what could potentially evolve into a prolonged conflict against the formidable Roman war machine. The time had come. As the Roman army emerged from winter hibernation in March, they dutifully executed Varus' strategy, albeit amidst logistical hurdles and a notable lack of vigilance. The precise location of the summer encampment remains obscured by the veil of time, likely nestled near or around modern-day Minden in Germany. Historical accounts depict Varus's summer demeanor as more administrative than martial, focusing on diplomatic engagements rather than military maneuvers. However, some historians scrutinize these narratives, citing biases from within his own chronicles particularly Patroclus's contentious portrayal of Varus. Nevertheless, for these legionaries, the season unfolded in a routine blend of drills and infrastructure projects, fortifying roads and defences. Meanwhile, Arminius strategically embedded within Rome ranks alongside his auxiliaries, patiently awaiting his moment to strike. In July, he set his plan into motion, instigating raids on Roman outposts while subtly engineering divisions from within the Roman forces. Exploiting the Roman commander's trust, Arminius orchestrated betrayals within the ranks, leveraging his insider status to sow chaos. 
Despite a momentary tip-off by Arminius's own father-in-law, Sergestus, Varus dismissed the warning. His judgment clouded by personal animosities and political intrigue. Don't trust the in-laws, no matter what you do. As late summer gave way to September, mounting unrest became the principal concern for Varus and his advisors. Sensing the narrow window of opportunity, some counselors cautioned against attempting to quell the rebellion, while also securing a safe return to winter quarters. Such a retreat along the familiar route would likely evade any concerted German resistance. However, in a daring move, Arminius proposed an alternative course, a campaign against the Angrivari. By traversing their territory, the Romans could both shorten their homeward journey and suppress the uprising. Varus, perhaps emboldened by the prospect of action after a pretty monotonous summer, opted to heed Arminius's counsel. On the dawn of September 7th, 9 AD, the Roman legions rallied for departure. Their ranks swelled with anticipation. Coinciding with the third payday of the year, the distribution of coins among the troops would later serve as a poignant marker for archaeologists discovering the battlefield. Buoyed by his promises of sanctioned looting during the Angrivari campaign, morale was surging within the ranks. Everyone was looking forward to having a big old party. That evening, Arminius bid farewell to Varus, under the pretext of mustering Cherusky auxiliaries, pledging to rejoin the main force in a matter of days. Don't worry, Varus, I'll be back soon. Unbeknownst to Varus, this encounter marked their final meeting. With the departure of Arminius, a significant portion of the Roman contingent was lost, severely impending their reconnaissance capabilities. Meanwhile, Arminius hastened northward to rally the Angrivari and Bructeri tribes to his cause. As the morning of September 8 dawned, the Roman legions broke camp and resumed their march through the dense forest, their progress hindered by the thick foliage that stretched out for miles and miles. Arminius, orchestrating the unfolding tragedy, orchestrated a series of coordinated attacks by his Bructeri allies, targeting the Roman column along its extended length. The onslaught, launched in the late morning, had the objective of exhausting the Romans and inflicting maximum damage to their supplies as javelins rained down on the beleaguered troops. With the Roman line stretched perilously thin over a distance of 15 to 20 kilometers, the Germanic warriors, armed with a variety of weapons including swords, long lances, and narrow-bladed short spears, quietly encircled the entire army. The skirmish was fierce, but brief the attackers swiftly withdrawing after achieving their objectives, likely in, in accompanied 
by the embedded Cheruski spies. That's right. There were many people marching with the Romans, waiting for the signal. Well, once they all ran away, the spies went with them. As if by a cruel twist of fate, a torrential downpour added to the Romans' woes, halting their advance. Varus, recognizing the gravity of the situation, ordered the construction of a fortified camp and convened a war council. Though casualty reports indicated relatively light losses, the vulnerability of the baggage trains, and not to mention the scout cavalry, was clearly evident. Under the cover of night, the Romans attempted a desperate escape, only to stumble into yet another trap set by Arminius near Calcris Hill. The terrain, with its narrow strip of open ground flanked by woods and swampland, offered very little respite. The Germanic alliance exploiting the natural barriers and fortified positions, launch relentless waves of assaults on the disoriented Roman forces. Amidst the chaos, Varus drew his last breath, choosing to take his own life rather than face capture or defeat. Other Roman commanders including Prefectus Caonius and Prefectus Aegeus, met similar fates, either falling in battle or succumbing to the culminated despair of their doomed cause. The aftermath of the Battle of Teutoburg Forest was nothing short of catastrophic for the Roman forces with casualties estimated to be between 15,000 to 20,000. Many Roman officers, faced with that grim reality of defeat, chose to fall on their swords in accordance with Roman tradition. It was the style at the time. Tacitus grimly recounts how some officers met a grisly fate, becoming sacrificial victims in the indigenous religious ceremonies of the Germanic forces. Their bodies cooked in pots, and their bones used for rituals for many years later. Others were subjected to ransom, while some common soldiers were likely enslaved by their victorious foes. Roman accounts paint a vivid picture of the utter devastation suffered by the legions, with archaeological findings at Calcris revealing approximately 6,000 pieces of Roman equipment compared to just a single clearly Germanic artifact indicating the severity of the Roman losses. It was not simply a loss for the Romans. It was a red-ass beatdown that they will never forget. However, the absence of substantial German relics can be attributed to their practice of removing the bodies of their fallen comrades from the battlefield and burying them along with their battle gear. So, maybe the Romans did manage to take a few of them out. Moreover, many Germanic soldiers, possibly numbering in the thousands, had deserted and donned Roman armor, further complicating the identifications of combatants in archaeological excavations. And do remember that, as we had already mentioned, 
the Germanic forces, if they were wearing armour, well, it was probably Roman armour. So from previous skirmishes, they may have geared up in Roman attire. I'm sure that was rather confusing for the Romans, trying to figure out who was one of theirs. In the wake of their triumph, the Germanic coalition swiftly swept through all Roman forts, garrisons, and cities east of the Rhine, asserting their dominance over the region. The remaining Roman legions in Germania, led by Varus's nephew, Lucius Nonius Asprenas, focused their efforts on fortifying positions along the Rhine to stem further incursions. Despite facing prolonged sieges, forts like Aliso, in present-day Haltern am See, managed to hold out for several weeks, if not months. Ultimately, the garrison under Lucius Cadicius, reinforced by survivors from the Teutoburg forest, successfully broke through the encirclement and reached the safety of the Rhine. Their valiant resistance brought enough time for Nonius Aspernas to organize the Roman defense along the Rhine with two legions, supported by the arrival of Tiberius with a fresh army. Together, they thwarted Arminius's ambitions of crossing the Rhine and launching an invasion into Gaul. The Battle of the Teutoburg Forest sent shockwaves throughout the Roman Empire, leaving Emperor Augustus profoundly shaken, literally shaking. According to the accounts of the Roman historian Suetonius in the Twelve Caesars, Augustus was so distraught upon hearing of the defeat that he was seen in a panicked state, pacing back and forth, repeatedly shouting, Quintilius Varus, give me back my legions. The loss was a devastating blow not only militarily, but also symbolically, marking the abrupt end of the triumphant Roman expansion that had characterized the period following the end of the Civil War four decades earlier. Of course, word was getting around, too, that the Romans were not as tough as perhaps thought. Well, they were still pretty tough. It took a while for them to fall, but eventually they did. And we'll get to that in another video soon. In the aftermath of the disaster, the Roman Empire underwent a significant re-evaluation of its military strategy. Tiberius, Augustus's stepson, assumed effective control and began preparations for the continuation of the war effort. Legions 17, 18, and 19, which had suffered such catastrophic losses, were never reconstituted. Womp womp. A stark departure from the Roman practice of re-establishing legions even after a defeat. Maybe they thought the name was bad luck. Instead, Legio II Augusta and 20 Valeria Victrix, along with 13th Gemina, were dispatched to the Rhine to replace the lost legions and reinforce the frontier defences, getting ready for the next fight. And there is 
always a next fight. For what is our history, besides the continued tapestry of conflicts and atrocities? More to come, of course. Well, what can we learn from all of this? I suppose, if anything, we can look at it from the German perspective first. How long can we plan for revenge? Is it ever too late to take it back? And what about the Roman perspective? How close should we keep our friends? Are they really friends, or are they simply enemies in disguise? Perhaps we can all look at our own circle of friends and try to examine very closely if there is an Arminius hiding. Well, thank you very much for listening. I really had fun recording that. I thought that was a great story, if I do say so myself. If you enjoyed it, how about you subscribe to the channel? I'm trying to push to uh, 3,000 this month. Ooh, glorious day that I receive the 5,000. So tell your friends about me. Otherwise, continue to enjoy the historical content that I'm pushing out with the utmost enjoyment. I'm the ASMR Historian. It's been a pleasure. See you in the next video, and good night.